An unforgiving Atlantic storm in August 2016 caught a lonely tug by surprise as it towed a massive orange oil rig on its last journey before destruction. Lashed by high winds and waves, the Transocean winner broke the tow and crashed into the shoreline of Britain's westernmost island, famed for its spectacular sea views and landscapes. Two weeks later, it was refloated and towed round the tip of the island. Only two months later could it be removed once and for all, in a triumph of technology as it was lifted out of the sea. For two months, the islanders watched anxiously as the head of salvage for the United Kingdom laid the groundwork for a successful salvage. On the morning of August the 8th, 2016, the shocked residents of Dalmore Beach on the island of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides woke up to find an orange steel monster washed up against the rocks of their wild coast. A massive 17,000 ton oil rig had appeared out of nowhere. Photographs of the Transocean winner quickly went round the world, the spectacular barren beauty of the place contrasting with the environmental hazard the rig represented. This was a massive steel structure embedded firmly on our shores. And we didn't know what damage that was doing to our shores. We don't know what pollution that might uh, be causing to our environment. So we all struggled for a couple of days, wondering what the implications were for us. I'm sure the costs were substantial. You know, the, the, you know, the salvers, the number of vessels that were there. Um, but it would be fair to say that throughout the operation itself that primacy was given, to just coming up with the best response and ensuring that the operation was carried out safely uh, without any damage to the environment. The Transocean winner is a particularly uh, challenging uh, cargo because we don't know exactly what the weight of the rig is. She's damaged, she's been laying around on rocks getting bigger and bigger damages over several weeks before our vessel arrived. What became evident straight away was that the rig was stuck on the rocks and would not be easy to dislodge. The UK Coast Guard was on the scene already, as they had been warned that the tug towing the rig was in trouble. Yeah, I first uh, heard about the incident just after 22.30 on the Sunday night uh, before she grounded, uh, just to let me know that the, the tug and tow was in difficulty. There was a danger of the line parting. Uh, and in early hours the following day, um, I was advised that the line had parted and the rig actually grounded on the Isle of Lewis, uh, just around about uh, 0600 hours. Britain's Maritime and Coast Guard Authorities headquarters is in Southampton, and this is where the United Kingdom's representative of the Secretary of State for Maritime Salvage operates from, managing maritime emergencies. He flew to the island of Lewis to coordinate the salvage and hear what the owners of the rig had to say. An emergency crew was quickly sent aboard to survey the damage. What they found alarmed the local population. At least two of the diesel oil tanks that supplied the four engines were ruptured. Salvage options, uh, Smith Salvage were appointed by Transocean uh, with a view to carry out an assessment and uh, to refloat the rig itself. But obviously in the back of my mind, uh, the other uh, thought I, d I did have was if they didn't manage to successfully refloat her, then we may be looking at a wreck removal operation, uh, which would have been ex extremely difficult in that exposed part of the coast. It may just have been cutting the, 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 the whole installation down, starting to remove some of the heavy equipment, but you know, in the exposed area she was, uh, that would not have been a, a quick option and we would have probably been looking at well over a year for completion of that operation itself. The rig's owners, Transocean, contacted the world's foremost salvage company, Smith Salvage, 
based close to Rotterdam and equipped with its own tugs and equipment, to do the job in a hurry. Smith's long history of successes includes participating in raising the Kursk submarine and, more recently, the two car carriers, Tricolor and Baltic Ace. The Dutch company sent a unique salvage master with experience in refloating snagged rigs. Smith's salvage master, Sylvia Tervoort, had experience in recovering another oil rig, this time in Alaska. Shell's Kuluk had similarly broken loose and run aground. The Kuluk was refloated and towed away, a solution Smith and Transocean hoped to apply here too. The Transocean winner is a 17,000 ton semi-submersible oil rig that for years was used for prospecting the seafloor for reserves of hydrocarbon fuels. The rig itself, uh, I think she first came into commission in the early 80s. Uh, she was on, a, on passage from Norway uh, to Malta. She weighed about 17,000 tonnes itself and dimension-wise uh, she was approximately 70 metres by 70 metres uh, by about 40 metres depth. She has three cranes, a bridge and a helicopter landing deck and can accommodate 108 people on board. On the night of the wreck, the rig was unmanned, but it did contain 280 tonnes of diesel oil for propulsion. Uh, when the salvers uh, managed to get on board the, the rig itself, they found there was significant damage uh, to the tanks uh, down in the sponsons or the pontoons. Uh, the the, the uh, pontoons itself, they um, included the tanks for the, the water ballast and also the fuel was kept down there. And it was fairly quickly ascertained that uh, at least two of the, fo of the four fuel oil tanks uh, had been breached. Um, and it was estimated that about 53 cubic metres of diesel had been lost uh, during the impact of the grounding itself. The Transocean winner is a semi-submersible rig, which means it floats on the sea with a maximum depth of 450 metres and is held in place by eight anchors. It is able to drill to a depth of 7,600 metres into the sea floor to explore for hydrocarbons. It is equipped with two 45 metre long cranes and one shorter 20 metre long knuckle crane for movements on board. The rig was already old and this was to be its final voyage as overhauling it would not have been cost effective in the depressed oil industry. Deep water exploration is a speciality of the Transocean Company, whose headwaters are in Switzerland, with offices all over the world. It wasn't Transocean's first brush with disaster. Transocean owned the BP-operated Deepwater Horizon rig that caught fire in the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 and causing an oil spill among the worst in American history. Ultimately, BP was held responsible for the incident. On the night of August the 8th, 2016, the Transocean winner was being towed by this tug, Alp Forward, owned by Dutch company Alp Maritime. It is 65 metres long, 18.5 metres wide, and has a draft of 8.8 .8 metres. She was on her way from uh, Norway to, to Malta. Uh, in, the intention was in Malta she would be decommissioned and then she would be towed the smaller distance then from Malta to Turkey for recycling. The Alp Forward and Transocean Winner combination set sail on August the 7th from Stavanger in Norway, one of Europe's oil and energy capitals and, like most of the Norwegian coast, a breathtaking place known for its mountains and beautiful fjords. With the Transocean Winner in tow, the tug left Norway heading for Malta via the open Atlantic around the west coast of Scotland. The Transocean winner was at the end of its career and was due to be dismantled and later scrapped. The rig and tug duo left their location in the North Sea despite a weather warning that a big Atlantic storm was brewing. 
These storms can be devastating. The ghostly rig was empty as the Alp forward pushed down the Atlantic. The rocky coastline of northern Scotland is strewn with hidden dangers with its highly irregular sea floor. And yet, every year, thousands of cargo ships, often laden with dangerous chemicals, sail by close in to shore. Most of the heavy traffic that passes these islands tends to travel to the west of us. And that includes vessels that will be carrying some really potentially difficult cargo if it were to find itself onto our shores. We have crude oil tankers that pass us by, and they're only passing by in the deep water channel two miles off our shores. Uh, and we also have chemical vessels with chemicals on board that would be dangerous and hazardous to the environment. They pass by very, very close. The route shown by the AIS signal sent by the tug suggests that it may have been trying to enter the bay to gain shelter from the storm. But what actually happened will be the subject of an investigation. At 6 a.m. on August the 8th, 2016, the Alp Forward's tow line broke and the crew were unable to control the rig. The local residents were aghast. The vessel that was towing the oil rig at about 6 p.m. on the evening of the 7th uh, put out a call to the Coast Guard to say that it needed assistance, uh, that it was having difficulty with the tow. A towing vessel based in Orkney was then uh, commissioned to come to its assistance, but it was some 18 hours away. So the towing vessel, as we understand it, uh, for the next several hours, between 6 p.m. and 4 in the morning, struggled uh, and lost the battle to hold this oil rig on its own. There was nothing that could be done now. The rig was on its own. The tug made its way to the shelter of the port of Stornoway, where it was kept on hand for the salvage. The Outer Hebrides, the islands of Lewis, Harris, North and South Uist, are the westernmost islands of Scotland. There is nothing between here and Newfoundland. Lewis is exposed to everything the Atlantic can throw at it. Wind, storms and dense fog. Lewis is an incredibly isolated place and getting salvage crews in and out of the island was no small feat. There are flights from the smaller airports of Scotland and twice daily ferries from Ullapoon. The rig ran aground near the small community of Carloway, on the northwestern shore of the island, famed for its black houses, reminiscent of ancient Viking homes, and the magnificent moors that stretch up to steep cliffs and secluded bays. The rugged, rocky coastline is home to seabirds, and its barren moors are dotted with calm lakes known for their wild trout. Close to Dalmore Beach, where the Transocean winner ran aground, are the Kalanish stones, all that is left of the Neolithic culture that once thrived on the island. They still lend an eerie sense of mystery to this farthest west of all the British Isles, where people still speak Gaelic. The local residents are mostly employed in the traditional Scottish Highland activities, such as fishing and sheep farming. The Scottish blackface sheep are shorn for the wool that is spun and then woven into the world-class woolen cloth known as Harris Tweed. Close to the site of the Transocean Winner wreck is a family-owned Callaway Tweed factory. Cut off the bit below the nuts, and this is what I cut off on Monday morning when I started stealing your load from the previous tweed. About 150 years ago, Lady Dunmore, I think her name was, from Aminsuya Castle, she started taking samples of the local tweed, which the crofters were making about 150 years ago, onto the mainland to show her friends down in London and Perthshire and all these places. And they liked it so much that they started placing orders for it. And that's where the business started about 150 years ago with <coughs> Lady Dunmore. For the locals, 
The massive beached oil rig was mostly an odd curiosity that brought a few new faces into town. But behind the scenes, many also had serious environmental concerns about the potential impact of an oil spill so close to shore. The main concern for me was the, the diesel oil itself. Uh, the, the, the position where the rig was grounded was less than four miles to uh, you know, one of the, the most environmentally sensitive areas on the island, uh, Loch Rogue. Um, it is designated in two areas as a conservation area and also there were 27 aquaculture sites in the loch itself. So our concern was that any oil, if it was to migrate in that direction, uh, could have potentially caused a lot of damage, uh, you know, to the industry there. Dalmore Beach is one of the island's best and is world famous for surfing. The white beaches and the Caribbean green waters of Lewis belie the extremely cold temperatures of the sea. The wreck of the Transocean winner was a blight on the island's broad horizon and threatened this remote and renowned surfer's paradise. Well, surfing is a huge, uh, hugely uh, important and popular uh, activity here, particularly at Dalmore Beach, where uh, the Transocean winner oil rig is. Uh, it is one of the best surfing uh, beaches anywhere in the United Kingdom. And not only do people come there to enjoy it, people come there to be trained, to be taught how to surf. So very, very important in this area. On the morning of August the 8th, 2016, the rig was firmly wedged on the rocks of the headland south of the beach. The horizontal crossbar of the rig was stuck fast between the rocks. The westerly winds were still strong and the local coast guard rushed to the scene. These images were filmed by one of the first responders. The first photographs made world news. Salvers managed to climb aboard, but were trapped by bad weather for two days. They assessed the damage and activated the generators. They found out that two of the oil tanks were breached, but there was no sign of an oil spill in the sea. Diesel fuel evaporates quickly. The oil rig was essentially intact, but the horizontal pontoon containing diesel fuels was stuck on the rocks. There was only one way of getting it off, to refloat it using the highest tide, called a leap tide, which occurs once every month. And the weather had to be good. We looked at the, um, you know, the, obviously the opportunities with the high waters, um, but it was really down to the salvage master and Transocean to decide when they would be ready and when there was the opportunity of, of the greatest success. What we didn't want to do was try and do the operation prematurely before we were ready to compromise the rig even further and cause more damage because with the incoming weather of that there was a danger if we didn't get her out you know, when we were ready on our agenda. Um, the longer she sat there we knew she was likely to sustain more damage mm. The tools that Smith needed to carry out the plan were transported to the remote island of Lewis. Smith's own tugs, the Union Bear, Union Princess and the Olympic Orion were brought in in support. An Augusta Westland 139 helicopter was flown from the Pyrenees with a Catalan crew. Salvage personnel from Transocean joined Smith and Coast Guard crews on board. Despite the cold and bad weather, the salvers were able to get the generator working and with it the three cranes on board, as well as essential lighting, heating and utilities, while the helicopter from the Pyrenees kept them supplied with what they needed. Hugh Shaw coordinated a committee of key players based in the town of Stornoway, the tiny capital of the island. I established what we call a salvage control unit uh, in Stornoway itself. I was meeting the key parties, the salvers, Transocean, uh, the environmentalists, uh, the Coast Guard on a daily basis to discuss the plans. Smith put forward a plan for refloating uh, the installation itself. Uh, but there were a number of things that had to be completed uh, before doing that. Obviously with the, the, the badly damaged tanks, 
uh, they needed to put compressors on board uh, to build up air pressure you know, in the tanks to give the required amount of buoyancy uh, for the refloat operation. The rig is equipped with four diesel engines and thrusters, but since these were to be of little use in the refloat, Salvers decided to remove all the fuel. One of the other requirements we had was that we, we needed to remove, we still had two intact uh, oil tanks down in the pontoon, and it was felt that they were still the always very vulnerable, that uh, should these tanks be ruptured during the refloat, then we could potentially lose over another 100 tonnes of, uh, of diesel oil. Uh, so the decision was made that, um, you know, where it was safe to do so was to pump this oil from the two intact tanks to pump the, the hydrocarbons up to a higher position, you know, in the rig using uh, the rig's equipment itself. Um, having done that successfully, we then made a decision that before the refloat itself, uh, we asked for that product to be removed from the rig. Other vessels were deployed too. Oil spillage was a real threat during all the operations, so two crane barges, equipped with floating barriers, were close at hand. They were kept in the Bay of Carlaway, where a small jetty allowed crews to land safely. As the days passed, the plan for refloating the rig came together, as local residents and journalists watched with a mix of concern and curiosity. There were 16 fuel tanks that could be emptied and filled with compressed air, and everything would depend on the tide. The tides of the Atlantic Ocean can be very high, and leap tides occur every month with the full moon. The full moon of August rose on the 18th, but the salvers were still not ready. There was a lot to be done yet, priority being given to sealing any fuel leaks. The local Callaway community began to grow anxious. The Coast Guard organised its meeting on the 18th and this time delivered some answers to the worried Callaway citizens. We got a huge amount of information. It was a very impressive uh, presentation and we're grateful that they came and did it. Uh, it. It really helped this community. So it wasn't a matter of waiting for the first opportunity, it was making sure that all the work was completed up into that stage. And it was as we were needing that that I was approached by the salvage master, you know, and Transocean, and they set the date, and I gave my approval that everything, if everything was in place by that time, I gave my consent uh, for the operation to, to work towards that. Um, the plan actually, we started with the uh, assessment. Um, the assessment is always ongoing um, because you never know if the condition of the rig will change. At the moment, we are looking at uh, pressurizing uh, compartments of the rig in order to refloat the rig. In order to do so, we have a lot of equipment coming. There is still a critical, a critical part uh, ahead of us, uh, and we need to perform a lot of uh, checks before we can say uh, when we will do the axial refloating, but uh, the, the method will be based on pressurization of uh, compartments. With the full moon now starting to wane, the high tides were getting lower and lower. The salvers would have to move fast, but the calculations provided by the marine architects were comforting. The need was to use every possible compartment in the rig to provide buoyancy, which meant not only offloading the diesel oil left on board, but attempting as much as possible to seal the breached tanks. The question would be relatively simple. Would the extra buoyancy be enough to raise the rig those three meters to get her unhooked? There were those in Callaway who had their doubts. I'm not the marine expert on high tides, but I'm a leisure fisherman. There is a high tide this weekend. If they don't grab it, if, if they're not ready to grab it, then they will have to wait quite some time for another one. And there will not be another one, I don't think, for another month at least. 
Well, the plan is we made a decision this morning at uh, the meeting I had with Transocean and Smith Salvage that uh, I've approved the, the go-ahead for a refloat tomorrow night on the high water. So uh, yesterday they started with the compressors, uh, trying to press up the tanks. That work continues today. So if all goes well, uh, we'll, we'll be in a good position to know tonight uh, if all of the 16 tanks that are required by the naval architects uh, are going to hold the pressure we required uh, for the refloat operation itself. The tide of Monday would be sufficiently above the average sea level and they needed to raise the horizontal pontoon over the rock. The rest of the rig would have to be able to float away too. Hugh Shaw was overseeing the decisions and ultimate responsibility lay with him as the UK government's representative. We're hopeful that with the buoyancy uh, it will be sufficient to lift it above any obstructions and she will float free from the, uh, the, where she's sitting at the moment. The Union Bear was called in to deliver seven powerful compressors to the rig that would be used to pump air into the fuel tanks. Loading the compressors was a laborious task, given the angle the rig rested at and the positioning of the cranes. And it was extremely difficult to, to, to really seal um, any of the, the chambers itself. Uh, there were some parts that uh, it wasn't safe to put divers you know, in the water to go near, so there was some ROV footage you know, taken to try and give the, the salvage master a better understanding of what damage was there. Uh, so there was no real sealing done as, as, as such, but uh, there was a number of flanges had to be fabricated on the island um, you know, for a connection of the air hoses. Uh, from the compressors and we used about seven compressors. The diesel oil also had to be removed so the Olympic Princess was called in to take it aboard. The two ships could not operate together so the debunkering could only happen once the compressors had been delivered. In the world of ship salvage every operation has to happen in a synchronized order. A single mistake in the order of operations can disrupt and delay a salvage for weeks. In the meantime, the helicopter crew took Sylvia on patrols up and down the shoreline to check for oil slicks. Her worst nightmare, given the absolutely pristine nature of the shoreline. The last sufficiently high tide of the month was on the 22nd of August at 9 p.m just two weeks after the Transocean winner ran aground. The day before, however, a dense fog enveloped the rig and the coastline. These extreme maritime conditions occur unexpectedly on the coast of the Outer Hebrides. The fog kept the helicopter grounded. How much would this poor weather delay operations? The island's marine architects, the Coast Guard, Hugh Shaw and the salver Sylvia Torvet all gathered at the Coast Guard headquarters in Stornoway. Everyone had agreed on a plan, but would it work? The conditions for a safe refloat would be at least 16 airtight tanks would have to be filled with compressed air and sealed and all heavy equipment taken off the rig. The weather would have to be clear and the sea calm. The rig would have to rise the three meters needed to unhook it from the rock and two tugs would have to tow it away. Then the tugs and rig would have to make it all the way round the butt of Lewis, a particularly dangerous stretch of water round the island. All this would have to happen during the darkness of night. Work carried on intensely on the 21st and well into the afternoon of the 22nd. Well, I think the risks obviously, if, if, if she is impaled there and she is holding, but we're not going to compromise what we've done up to this time. So 
Um, you know, we are going to see after tomorrow night a slight reduction in the high water heights. We still uh, salvage uh, masters advise me there still may be two opportunities to do it on this current cycle. But if not, we've we've removed uh, much of the threat from the diesel oil. Yesterday we, we transferred 200 tonnes from the installation onto one of the supply vessels. So the, the risk itself environmentally over the last uh, 24 hours has reduced considerably. There are only small quantities left on board now. The two tugboats owned by Smit Poscalis were the Union Bear, 73.5 metres long, 16.5 metres wide, with a draft of 6.9 metres and a pulling power of 187 tonnes, and the slightly smaller Union Princess. The Union Bear is seen here on the day before the refloat in the port of Stornoway. The two uh, vessels that were engaged in the refloat uh, was the Union Princess and the Union Bear. And um, they both made the connections uh, during that day in the lead up to the, to the refloat itself. And they were the two vessels that towed the rig round to Broad Bay itself. In these images shot during the night, the lights of the tugs and of the Transocean winner show the movements. The sea was calm. The spectators on shore were given hospitality and refreshments as the work on board continued frantically. There was a lot of uncertainties. Uh, you know, we, there, there were parts of the rig, uh, certainly below the water line, that had been difficult to survey. So although um, the salvers had a fair understanding of what damage there was and what buoyancy uh, they would require, there was always the danger that perhaps uh, you know, part of the pontoon might be impaled by, by one of the rocky outcrops. And although they may have had to their buoyancy, uh, there was no guarantee that the rig would float off itself. Uh, so having sp stood for several hours on the beach with a, a large number of uh, salvers and uh, other staff and members of the public, um, there was delight to see the rig, you know, starting to move itself into deeper water, you know, as the tug started to pull her, you know, off the beach. The tide began rising and the salvers watched impatiently. A small sea swell would also help raise the rig. I think there was the concern that the um, you know she may you know she may just simply swivel if she was um, stuck on the rocks itself, um, you know on that side. So again, we we probably passed the high water time, and it was actually after that um, when we started to see the movement, um, and and probably you know again minutes after that when you know we realised that she was finally clear of the rocky outcrop itself. Great delight, and uh, and what we did here in the background was a round of applause uh, from many of the there were hundreds of onlookers there, many members of the public, which I think was quite special, special moment in particular for the Salvage Master and her team, who had done such a fantastic job in uh, in managing to get her out from there. The plan had worked, and now the Transocean winner was afloat in deeper water. We got the rig into deeper water. Um, there was a period where the salvage master simply held the rig in that position. There was a need uh, for the people on board. We had uh, salvers on board, plus we had representatives from Transocean uh, on board, and I think their role was to go around to check the spaces, to make sure she wasn't taking water in any other areas that we weren't anticipating, and again, just trying to ensure that she was as stable as she could be before that tour commenced uh, up and around the Butter Lewis itself. Now that the rig was off the rocks, getting it around the island before the weather turned was the Salva's main priority. The Transocean winner was off the rocks, but the 9pm high tide had meant that the transfer around the butt of Lewis had to be carried out at night. This was a particularly dangerous moment for the whole operation. You know, there was still some concern that, OK, having successfully refloated the rig, uh, we still had a, you know, a tow which was going to take be 53 miles. Um, we'd estimated that tow may take about 18 hours 
to get the rig from the west of the island down to Broad Bay on the east side. And actually that took, um, you know, nearly 40 hours at the end of the day. So that was, we knew that was still going to be a precarious, you know, part of the operation. That would be the first time that the naval architect and the salvers would be able to perhaps better understand what damage was. Um, and knowing that, um, you know, the rig was simply going to be getting kept afloat by the compressors. Once the rig was in the bay off Stornoway, it could be repaired and a plan for removing it could be made. The decision was reached to hire an amazing vessel to take the rig away. The OHT Hawk is a semi-submersible ship. It can be sunk and then refloated with cargo aboard. When the ship recovers buoyancy, it takes the load into the deck and can sail away. Uh, to submerge the vessel, what we do first is, uh, is to, to start filling up uh, the tanks until the uh, main deck is almost underwater. And this is a very critical stage, because if you have uh, free water running around in the tanks when you submerge, the vessel loses its stability, and that's very critical. The Hawk is owned by the Norwegian company OHT that is specialized in hiring out ships for specific tasks. The Hawk was originally built as an oil tanker and uh, in 2008-2009 we uh, took her into a shipyard in uh, China and converted her into the vessel that we see today. We uh, removed uh, a 60 meter section of uh, the midship and we took down uh, the depth of the vessel from 26 meters down to the 13 meters that the vessel has today. She has a weight of uh, 25,600 tons, but when she's sailing, she has 85,000 tons. And if she's submerging, the weight of the vessel is actually 130,000 tons. But how does a semi-submersible ship actually work? We, uh, we have specially designed the ballast system to make sure that we can fill the tank up to only a very few centimeters of, uh, of air pockets in the, in the tanks. And only when all this is under control, the crew on board will fill the rest of the tanks so that the water, the, that the deck submerges underwater. And the, in, this, uh, in this phase, we can go down in only a few hours, two, three hours from, uh, from uh, deck just above water until the loading draft when we can take the rig over the deck. What are the special complications in loading it? Uh, there are many, many things to, uh, to take good care of when you want to submerge the vessel. One thing is, uh, is uh, uh, free surfaces, as we call it, uh, water uh, being able to flow from one side to the other inside the tanks. The vessel has uh, 78 ballast tanks and there can be a lot of water flowing around. And that's very important for the crew to, to manage and to make sure that the tank is either completely full or completely empty and we have uh, designed the systems to make that job easy. It arrived on the 21st of September 2016, six weeks after the rig was rammed ashore. The weather was changing fast, with autumn turning towards the dark northern winter. The oil rig's high profile made it unstable once the anchors had been released. Uh, the waves are also important. We have a very, very low wave uh, limit for these loading operations because you have two floating objects. One is the ship that floats and, and uh, um, uh, heaves up and down with a certain frequency. And then you have the cargo with another frequency floating up and down. And when these come close to each other, they can hit each other and, and you can have big damage both to uh, the cargo and, uh, and to the ship. It would take another two weeks before a window of fine weather allowed the tugs to tow the rig over the sunken deck of the Hawk. When we load a cargo like the Transocean Winner, uh, she's brought across to the submerged vessel by tugs. 
So, so the rig has uh, one tug connected in each uh, corner, comes near the vessel, and then we use our workboat to run lines across to the, to the rig. From there, uh, we start pulling in and, uh, and the tugs give slack. And when we have full control of the cargo, when she's uh, over our deck, then we start pulling her up against two nine meter tall guide posts. Once the massive and severely damaged orange rig was precisely positioned over the deck of the Hawk, the re-ballasting could begin. We have planned carefully in advance where these, uh, these uh, guide posts are going to hit the cargo. And we do that very, very, very slowly. So there's very little force going into them. It's a very controlled uh, operation. So we pull the cargo onto the guide posts and see that the uh, lines align with the center of the guide post. And then we give the order to the chief officer to start deballasting the vessel. And we deballast until we have uh, full contact with the vessel and see that everything uh, is in order. The Maritime Coast Guard Agency and Hugh Shaw could breathe a sigh of relief. The role of the UK's Coast Guard in this incident was exemplary. Well, I think the MCA Maritime Coast Guard Agency has got a, an extensive role right, right through the incident. Um, for myself, they provided the facility you know, and the infrastructure to support the salvage control unit that, that I chair with the other key stakeholders. They provide the communications through the Coast Guard uh, side of the business, you know, out to all the vessels involved in the operation. Um, they were responsible for the counter pollution and salvage, uh, you know, uh, branch within the business. They were responsible for approving the all spill contingency plans that should we be unlucky enough to have a spill, then you know, they, they could ensure that the plan was appropriate and the right equipment was there to deal with it. They were bringing in the aerial surveillance aircraft. Finally, on the 12th of October 2016, the Hawk lifted the Transocean winner out of the sea. The rig began its final voyage to Malta for demolition. One last adventure in its long life drilling for black gold. The island of Lewis could return to its tranquil, wild state. But questions remain about government cuts that removed the Coast Guard tugboat from Stornoway, leaving the island without an emergency response capacity. But I think it would be fair to say that uh, once the towing line had disconnected, it would have been extremely difficult. Obviously, the out forward itself, the towing vessel, had tried to establish um, a reconnection. With the rig being unmanned itself, it would have been extremely difficult for, for any vessel or any, any number of vessels, had they been there, uh, to effect another connection. Um, so I don't think um, you know, the fact that there was no tug there had, had any impact on, on this incident itself. The Transocean Winner incident is an example of the kind of accident that could happen in the wild North Atlantic as cargo ships sail by these beautiful islands whose residents live peacefully off the land and the sea, unaware of the potential threat that ploughs the waves just a few miles westwards. However, the swift removal of the Transocean Winner from the rocks of Dalmore Beach is also the result of efficient salvage operations, closely monitored by Britain's authorities on one of its most remote shores. <laughs>